The first signs I saw that ContraPoints had published her video on cancelling were a number of non-binary people I know on Twitter locking their accounts. When I saw a couple of padlocks I thought that maybe something is happening with these specific people, but the number very quickly grew. That's when I saw the post, all of them mentioning the same name, the same cause for this response. Natalie Wynn. Whilst Natalie assists fans and those who saw no issue with her problematic behaviour that harms the non-binary community celebrated her video, I saw my friends and my co-workers reacting as if they'd heard the online equivalent of a hurricane siren, that the best thing for them to do until Natalie Storm had passed was hole up and hope her fans didn't come for them. Because that's where we are right now. Not only has Natalie drained people's hopes for her as a force for good, she's actually instilled a sense of dread in them, to the point that their response to her presence is to hammer down the hatches and just wait for her to go away. That she's a force of destruction. All intention aside. Now before I continue to respond to Natalie's cancelling video, I just wanted to start by going over something I forgot to discuss in my previous video relating to Natalie and Buck Angel. If you haven't already seen that video, please do. There's also my first video tackling Natalie's flawed model and her terrible case study meant to prop it up. So in my last video I discussed Buck Angel and how his behaviour was not only terrible on account of outing a trans woman, but that his actions fell within the realm of domestic abuse. And to drive home that point, I stated the following. I get that our understanding of domestic abuse has advanced since the early 2000s, hence the victims of Buck's actions might not even realise that what he did was domestically abusive. The point is, I don't give a fuck. To my knowledge, Buck Angel has never admitted fault over what he did, has never tried to make amends. In fact, he still seems to revel in what he did. Turns out I forgot to include the evidence I had of this, specifically a 2014 interview with Buck Angel. Yet I realised I'd failed to do so only after I'd done the recording and rendering for my video. So I included it in said video's pinned comment and decided that I'd discuss it further in this one. So yeah, the stuff we're about to go on to discuss comes from a 2014 interview, which yes, I realise is half a millennia in Natalie's mind. But for the rest of us, I think it shows us how Buck Angel, in spite of having time to change, really hasn't. So all this takes place 11 years after his divorce with Karen Winslow, 8 years after his outing of Lana Wachowski. The first item to discuss is the way in which the interviewer asked them about Lana Wachowski, only for Buck Angel to deadname her before acknowledging her actual name, to then proceed to deadname and misgender her for the rest of the interview. However, that's not the only issue. Before this, when the interviewer mentions Karen Winslow by name, Buck responds with the following, quote, Isla Strix, that's her dominatrix name. That was her real name, end quote. Now here's the thing, as far as I can tell, Karen hung up her dominatrix job and name when she divorced Buck. Kinda like a superhero hanging up their role, Karen acknowledges Isla Strix as part of her history, but doesn't go around identifying with it in an active sense, a choice she herself has made. So for Buck Angel to effectively come along and strip her of that choice and the autonomy that comes with it, that genuinely makes my skin crawl. Reminder that Karen's dungeon business was co-run by Buck Angel and is something she stopped doing when she left him. So by asserting that her former performance name is her real name, Buck Angel is effectively telling her that he will always be a definitive part of her life. That even 11 years after their divorce, after giving up that name, it is still who she is. That she will never escape him. Which is pretty fucked up, all things considered. As an interesting side note, Buck Angel discusses how his current marriage, the one he got into in November of 2003, is also on the rocks. Why? Well, according to Buck Angel, quote, I will never compromise for anybody, end quote. Now it's interesting that he takes this holistic approach to his then pending divorce, claiming that quote, So we grew apart. I travel a lot. Things happen, people grow. She grew, I grew. End quote. 
all in the same interview in which Buck Angel seeks to strip Cam Winslow, another one of his former wives, of her autonomy. All of which leads me to conclude that his lack of care for the ending of this relationship is less to do with some growth in his character. That's more to do with the way in which he never stopped obsessing over Karen and will continue to try and assert his perceived authority over her as a woman. So with that, I hope I've made the basis for my statements clearer. It also does away with Natalie's it was a decade ago argument. Buck Angel hasn't stopped going after Karen Winslow and Lana Wachowski, so why the fuck would we stop going after him for doing so? So with that out of the way, let's get back to Natalie's video, specifically relating to discussion surrounding her critics. Now I have a situation here in the fact that few of the people Natalie displays or mentions in her video have come forward to tell me that they're very afraid to be part of further discussion or even begged me not to discuss their tweets. This is including people who have had Natalie blocked on Twitter since 2018, since her video, The Aesthetic. And these are just the ones I've talked to. There's one exception to all this, so I'll go on to discuss her case later since it's pretty damning to Natalie's whole narrative, showing how parts of her cancelling model seem more like her projecting her own reaction to her critics onto them. Fact is, I do want to note some general things about the rest of the tweets Natalie shows, specifically in the section in which she looks at the responses to her, so pushing aside the responses her friends and others received for later. Specifically, the 35 screenshots Natalie shows between 58 minutes and 1 hour, 4 minutes and 25 seconds. There's also the screenshot she showed earlier in the Buck Angel section. So I read through every single one of those tweets without Natalie's commentary and a few things started to become apparent. For a start, many of the tweets were so small that the idea of using them when talking about how she is being hit by endless abuse seems rather odd. Five of the 36 images had less than five likes, a further three had less than ten. Yet, Natalie somehow feels they're worth mentioning. There's also the tweet posted on the 2nd of September, which Natalie does not acknowledge as such, a month and a half before Opulence was ever published, which she reads out at 59 minutes and 29 seconds in. Which really does show that a lot of the criticism Natalie received to Opulence was due to already building tension. That, no, it was not just a 10 second cameo that resulted in all of this. However, one of the most disturbing things I realised about reading these tweets was, well, just how tame the vast majority were. Most of them just said, fuck a lot. Which, considering Natalie repeatedly uses the T-slur in this video, she doesn't really have any ground to lecture others on language. Beyond that, the only things really above that level in what she showed was someone telling her to eat shit and another one telling her to eat their entire ass. Considering the abuse Natalie has brought down upon the non-binary community with this video and her early endorsement of Buck Angel, it's all really tame. Not one of the tweets shown in this segment is out of place or goes too far. It doesn't really show anything other than the fact that Natalie has a very fragile ego. Something further exacerbated in the fact that many of these people had her blocked or did not tag her in their thread. Which, as I suggested in my previous video, doesn't exactly give the impression of a bloodthirsty mob banging down Natalie's door and readying the guillotine. Most of these posts were people publicly venting their pain and subsequent anger. Emotions they felt as a direct result of Natalie's repeated transgressions in flippant disregard for the thoughts and well-being of the rest of the trans community. So now that I've made that clear, what about the doxing and the threats that Natty goes on to discuss in relation to people such as Ollie from Philosophy Tube? Well, let me start by saying two things. First, I don't doubt this happened. I know what can happen in these situations, having been through something similar recently. Second, I condemn all acts of threatening or doxing, whether it be of Natalie herself or her friends and colleagues. I hope that people have been reported to the police so that proper investigation may be carried out. I just want to make those two things absolutely clear before continuing. Because Natalie is not being honest here in how she brings Ollie into the topic. 
Following mentioning how various people Natalie is associated with or were part of the video, opulence have been approached by people asking them to clarify their own thoughts on the matter. Natalie leads into Ollie of Philosophy Tube with this. Ollie of Philosophy Tube released his own statement affirming his support of non-binary people, but adding, Sadly, I've also been harassed, threatened, doxxed, had my private life speculated on, and my loved ones insulted. In recognizing the feelings of those who kindly raised their concerns in a polite way, I do not wish to legitimize the great many people who use their hurt as a cover for unacceptable toxic and abusive behavior. And here are some responses to Ollie. As a non-binary fan of yours, I'm disappointed in this non-apology. Again, what exactly is he supposed to be apologizing for? Ever having associated with me? Things we are going to criticize Ollie Philosophy Tube for. Being a sniveling, hypocritical piece of shit. Refusing to listen to trans people. Actively, openly, and repeatedly mocking the trans people he refuses to listen to. Thanks for the apology. Now stop endorsing contrapoints. Now keep in mind that what these Twitter people are doing is demanding that cis people publicly condemn a trans woman for loosely associating with another trans person. Does that strike anyone else as wildly inappropriate? Well, first of all, those Twitter people are non-binary and binary trans people, trying to recover from what Natalie chose to knowingly do, hoping that their favorite creators won't dismiss their concerns out of hand as Natalie admits to having done. The dishonesty comes in how Natalie frames this message as if it were Ollie's initial response to the people openly criticizing her. That's why she asks, what exactly is he meant to be apologizing for? The truth, meanwhile, is that Ollie tweeted out the following on the 13th of October, as it became apparent that many trans people were left feeling betrayed by Buck Angel's inclusion in Natalie's video. Quote, I'm in this, and it's really good, and even though she'll be the cancellation of me someday, I stan. End quote. Which translates to a bit of a punch in the teeth for non-binary and binary trans people taking issue of what happened. Don't get me wrong, it doesn't justify the harassment or the doxing, but the harsh public criticism? Most certainly. He's joking very openly about our very genuine pain? Now, I hadn't even seen Ollie's later post on the 20th until Natalie's video because when he made that joke, I just said, fuck it, unsubscribed and unfollowed. But looking back at the whole message that Natalie conveniently crops down to that one paragraph rather than show the whole thing and highlight the focus? I can see why. It does come across as a tad insincere and self-promotional. The first and largest paragraph reads to me as being more dedicated to self-promotion about an upcoming video rather than an apology for laughing at the non-binary community's pain. The same is true of the last line. I don't want an apology to be self-promotional, check out my video and my live stream. I want it to be an apology, given for the benefit of the people you clearly mocked with intent. But there is no unified thought on this. Some trans folk took the apology as sincere, others less so. But when you have the whole story of what Ollie did and what his apology included, perhaps we can begin to understand why the people Natalie is reading out responded the way they did. It's certainly not as unreasonable as she pretends. And that's how you show context. As for why people do the thing where they ask associated people to distance themselves from someone who has repeatedly failed to support the non-binary community through their actions, I think it's pretty simple. These are people who have had their perspective surrounding a person they had a deep admiration for shattered. These are people struggling to adjust to that, and they're afraid. They're afraid that the people you're associated with share the same unwillingness to listen to marginalized voices, that they'd happily work with someone who would harm the community for self-gain. So they ask them, and very often, the answer is disappointing. Now you might say that you didn't ask for this. And the problem with that is, that's your responsibility which comes with the power you have. Who you associate with matters. Your cis audience will take your acceptance and gushing admiration for Buck Angel to be an approval of his sentiments. Or at least a declaration that they're minor enough issues not to merit action on your part. 
And as I said in my last video, that impacts the non-binary community. It results in us being questioned and demonized, in us being forced out of spaces which we previously thought safe for us. And just as your approval for Buck Angel has this consequence, their approval of you can have much the same. With great influence comes great responsibility in wielding that influence. And if you don't like it, you can always get a different job, but you cannot have that power without said responsibility. Now, Natty goes on to discuss another example of this, a case I find particularly interesting for a variety of reasons. So, let's check out the relevant segment. Even Mia Mulder, a trans woman who has never publicly associated with me, got attacked because she tweeted a heart at Ollie, you know, after he made the post discussing being doxxed and threatened. And just for that, she gets put on the enemy list. I'm sad to say that Mia is on the list of people that have stood by ContraPoints as she's continued to be a bigoted piece of shit. To which Mia responds, stood by ContraPoints? Jesus Christ. No matter what I do, people call me out and I'm not even related to the video and I don't even know Natalie. The chain of guilt by association is so long and twisted, I can barely even follow it. So the going after Mia, who tweeted a heart at Ollie, who failed to condemn me for my voiceover casting of Buck Angel, who was retweeted by a turf. We're only missing a couple degrees of separation before every living person on the planet Earth is cancelled over the Buck Angel situation. Which might be an interesting point if it weren't for the very simple facts that within 22 minutes of me responding, Comrade Sarah had retracted their original tweet and issued a public apology both in the thread they were talking to Mia in, and in a standalone post on their wall. Something Comrade Sarah personally contacted me with, in hopes that I'd bring it to people's attention. Because it was seen that Natalie's only about forgiveness for herself, and not the vulnerable people who lashed out in pain and anger, only to immediately apologise without reservation, when they took things a little too far. Thing is, Natalie demonstrates that she understands people lashing out in anger and frustration. How it's only a human response when one faces a feeling of great injustice. And she shows this by going over how she's expected to respond. But in response to these attacks, I, as a powerful person with a platform, I'm not allowed to react like a human being. I'm not allowed to get angry. I'm not allowed to show pain. I'm not allowed to get defensive. I'm not allowed to lash out. All I'm allowed to do is go totally numb on the inside as I try to frantically calculate the ideal public relations response that pays due deference to the valid concerns of these poor marginalized people, all the while ignoring the tsunami of verbal abuse that's crashing over me. And whilst I can pretend that segments such as these surprise me? By this point in the video, that'd be a lie. Why? Well, because I see Natalie frame the situation in this manner at various points throughout the video. That was just a sample of hundreds and hundreds of tweets. And all of this, let me remind you, is over a 10 second voiceover clip in a 48 minute video about a completely unrelated topic. Like, how do you work? How do you create when a decision so trivial can become the main event for weeks of your life? And the main problem with both these sentiments? Well, it all goes back to what I pointed out at the start of my second video. How this pity party naturally throws over the fact that she repeatedly hurt the non-binary community, only to prop up a vocal bigot as an honoured guest, all with full pre-knowledge that there was an issue. Now, I was aware at the time that trans Twitter hated Buck Angel, but my thinking was, well, trans Twitter kind of hates every trans celebrity, and they certainly hate me, so I wasn't going to let that stop me. Little did I know quite how vicious things were about to get. So it's not just about the size of your platform. It's about you taking responsibility for your actions. Because here's the thing. The non-binary community did absolutely nothing to invite upon us the shit Natalie has been doing for the past couple of years. We were content living our lives, enjoying her content, celebrating this growing bread shoe thing along with the rest of you. We did not draw the first blood, so to say. That was Natalie. And she did it again, in spite of the fact that she knew there was a problem. She knew a lot of non-binary and binary trans people hated Buck Angel's guts. And rather than investigate those concerns, 
reminds that Natalie had already had several run-ins with the non-binary community, so one would expect her to give us extra thought. She decided to brush our concerns aside and gush over a man who continues to inflict harm upon us. We were the ones responding to what she originally did. We were the ones venting our frustration, our pain, our anger. And that's what Natalie has tried to police. That's what her video sought to vilify. Natalie is so wrapped up in herself that she doesn't realize that not only is she trying to cut off our emotions, but she thinks our pain is morally equal to hers. When you are the person who initiated harm against an entire community that did absolutely nothing to you, other than give you every chance to fix your past behavior, yes, you have to suck it up. You have to do the right thing. That is what a decent person does. They don't carry on doing the very thing they've been criticized for. If you punch me and I punch you back in self-defense, those actions, whilst the same in physicality, are morally different. And if you, the instigator of the violence, decide to punch me a second time, in spite of the facts that I've punched you in defense, that is equally immoral, if not more so, than the first time you punched me. And that is the principle that Natalie is arguing against right now. She's arguing for the right to hurt the non-binary community because they criticized her in response to the facts that her actions caused us harm. And she's willing to go so far as to compare that criticism of her actions and subsequent failure to fix that actions to psychological rape. In this video, I use the word canceling more or less synonymously with what feminist Joe Freeman, author of The Bitch Manifesto, calls trashing. Trashing is a particularly vicious form of character assassination which amounts to psychological rape. Thing is, Nasty goes on to discuss the overstatement of harm later on, pretending like the non-binary people who have been hurt by her inclusion and promotion of Buck Angel, both in the credits of her video and on Twitter following its publishing, that that's what it is. Yet I feel like Natalie is projecting here an issue I believe her example demonstrates very well. The overstatement of harm is used as a justification for cruelty and for escalating conflict. So for example, and this is my example, not Shulman's, TERFs fixate on the exaggerated danger that trans women supposedly pose to cis women. And in very classic overstatement of harm, they'll describe everything they don't like as rape. Trans women entering women's spaces is rape. Trans women existing, Janice Raymond, is rape. And then they use that exaggerated harm as a justification to retaliate against them, to dox and harass and shun. Well, the same kind of logic is used to justify abusive behavior within the trans community. The dualistic thinking, the essentialism, the pseudo-moralism. All of this allows people on Twitter to treat me in an obviously abusive way, all the while feeling like they're doing the right thing because they're attacking the enemy. Trashing is a particularly vicious form of character assassination which amounts to psychological rape. That these things are mere minutes apart, much like her admitting that she knew non-binary people had an issue with Buck Angel but decided to ignore it before claiming she's happy to listen to the concerns of non-binary people, really show how poorly thought out her entire video is. That there are these major contradictions mere minutes apart. Now, Natalie rightly predicted that people would catch on to this, and so she decided to try and preemptively respond. Something that didn't exactly go well. And I realize that some people will say that I'm the one who's overstating harm to evade criticism. Well, look, you've seen the tweets the furious demands for me to be exiled, the doxing and threatening and ordering around of my colleagues, the attempts to isolate me from my community, the attacks not on my actions, but on who I am as a person. There's not really anything ambiguous about this. It's just abuse. But I don't think it feels like abuse to the people who are doing it. They feel like they're punching up because I'm a celebrity with a platform and lots of Twitter followers. And it's true that I do have more power than any of them individually. But as a collective, they have a terrifying power that they don't seem to be aware of as individuals. Yes, I've seen the incredibly mundane tweets that came as a final watershed response to many trans people feeling like you've been leading them on for years, 
promising that you're better, that this time you won't hurt us like before. A response which, contrary to what you assert, is entirely based in your actions, and it extends beyond you. It extends to the actions of Buck Angel which have harmed the trans community significantly for the past 14 years. Buck Angel is no trans activist. He's just a famous trans person who keeps being plugged by cis media. He loves the attention and the fans excusing his behavior as he treats other trans people like shit, which is part of the reason I find sentiments such as these so dishonest. The situation here is that any cis person who defends me, or even associates with me in any way, will be labeled a transphobe. Any binary trans person who associates with me will be branded an NB-phobe. And any non-binary people who associate with me will be ostracized from their own community. So on the internet I find myself increasingly alone. I'm isolated by the harassment. And that is ultimately the point to exile me from my community, from any community. And it's all because I refuse to participate in doing exactly that to Buck Angel. My experiences have made me so disillusioned with the idea that social media callouts can lead to any kind of justice that I've essentially sworn off participating in them. Buck has demonstrably harmed the trans community in many ways. A fact you've been shown evidence of, a fact you admit to being aware of to some degree before going ahead and including him. Yet, Rather than say, find another guy to voice the role, you went out and asked Buck Angel to do it, as an honoured guest, telling those of us who take issue with the harm it brought with it that our concerns, our pain, our anger, well it doesn't fucking matter. As for how isolated you feel, that's only on account that you've continued to hurt and push non-binary and binary trans people away to the point that we're not going to keep accepting the consistent stream of excuses, half-assed apologies, and empty promises to do better. There comes a time in some relationships, even parasocial ones, where things are growing so bad that there's no coming back. And that's what you can't handle. The fact that you've dragged us along the ground for so long that we're giving up on you. That you had one last chance to fix things for most of us. And you blew it on this. The promise of cancelling was that it was going to give power back to people who had none and bring justice to prominent abusers. It's in a way the 21st century version of the guillotine, the bringer of justice, the people's avenger. But also like the guillotine, it can become a sadistic entertainment spectacle. And I want to make the case that we do have, well, a teensy bit of a reign of terror situation on our hands, Gorge. I honestly think that most of the James Charles as a sexual predator crowd just wanted to bring him down a peg. You can pretend you just want an apology. You can pretend you're just a concerned citizen who wants the person to improve. You can pretend you're simply offering up criticism when what you're really doing is attacking a person's career and reputation out of spite, envy, revenge. I, I mean, it could be any motivation. Twitter viewed James as an overprivileged, spoiled little brat, and it was fun to wipe the smile off his smug face, at least for a few weeks. It's schadenfreude, right? This kind of petty sadism. But Twitter needs to establish that he's a horrible person, because this is the strategy they've chosen to establish that I am a horrible person. Stop. Freeze exactly where you are. Take a look at yourself and what all of us have been doing for the last 30 seconds. Who does this behavior remind you of? If your answer is social justice advocates fighting for trans equality, you are incorrect. If your answer is creepy stalkers who hate trans people, I am very suspicious of anyone whose online behavior prompts me to dig through articles full of dead names and sordid scandals involving trans people from almost two decades ago. This is very similar to techniques used against trans people by internet fascists. So I'm pretty suspicious of anyone pushing this kind of investigation. How can you tell the difference between a trans anarcho-socialist with an anime avatar and a Nazi pretending to be a trans anarcho-socialist with an anime avatar? Well, you can't. Anonymous is anonymous is anonymous, whether it's on 4chan or Twitter. This is none of my fucking business. And it's none of yours either, so shut up and go back to Kiwi Farms where you belong. I'm saying this in the cuntiest way and they deserve it. They fucking deserve the cuntiness. But when people are canceling me, they're not bringing up my problematic tweets because they want me to revise my beliefs. No, 
what they're doing is accumulating evidence to support the case they've decided to make that I am a horrible person who must be shunned. And I think most people are aware of that. In fact, I think the demand for an apology itself is often insincere. You have just spent the last one hour and 40 minutes drip feeding your fans this narrative that your critics, mostly non-binary and binary trans people who could no longer support your work due to your actions, that were acting in bad faith, that were deceptive, that were lying, that were acting like fascists, that were actually fascist, that we just want to tear you down. The result of which, as described at the start of this video, is the fact that a significant portion of the trans community is terrified of you, Natalie. Absolutely fucking terrified. Thousands of non-binary and binary trans people have learned exactly what it means to criticize Natalie Wynn in good faith. And they've learned it's easier to stay silent than receive the abuse. I've tried to share my thoughts in leftist circles, and the moment I'm remotely critical of your actions, Natalie, the moment I bring out my evidence issues with your actions, I am slammed damn hard. Cis people rain down on me, accusing me of trying to get rich, of seeking to replace you, of being a far-right plant. Now, thankfully, I'm used to it by this point. I've been in the secular community since 2011. I survived both the elevator gate pushback and the gamergate infiltration. But for others, it's a very different story. One of the people who contacted me to tell me how afraid they were to speak out on the subject due to their mental health, well, they're one of the growing voices in the non-binary community. And they feel like they've effectively been silenced by Natalie and her poisoning of the well. A poisoning that has taken place on an industrial scale. There is a difference between spontaneous acts of violence like that seen in the doxing and harassment of Natalie and her friends, and directed abuse towards people. There were no large figures going around pointing fingers at Natalie and her friends. There was a disjointed collective of people, some of whom acted inappropriately. That's not the same as what Natalie has done in this video by any measure. She has directed her audience's anger towards the non-binary community and the rest of her critics. Something she needs to account for. Natalie has to realize that for as much as she cries about cancelling, we didn't achieve anything. Her channel's booming. Cis dudes are flocking to it like never before and her Patreon has shot up, not down, Meanwhile, many of the people she's shown in this video, people including those who had her block since 2018 and were venting to themselves, they're just holding on until the abuse that Natalie has directed and enabled through her video stops. If there is any argument against cancel culture to be had in Natalie's video, it is a fact that it can often backfire, that the most Vulnerable people speaking out on the issue can become prime targets for abuse. A point that makes this earlier clip entirely self-unaware. If you're a superstar, then being cancelled most likely does not destroy you. The cancelers blend into the general backdrop of haters, and they can set you back a few million subscribers and a lot of emotional turmoil, but in the long run, they can't really touch your success. But here's the thing. What if you're not James Charles? What if you're a small creator? What if you can't afford public relations help? What if you belong to a marginalized community and you rely on that community for support? Well, in that case, it's a whole different story. That's exactly what you have done, Natalie. You have targeted your audience of 800,000 subscribers at various vulnerable people who spoke out in anguish when your actions cause them harm. You double down and escalated things, which frames shit like this in a very different light. There's a fairly prominent figure in leftist politics who I could absolutely hashtag me too, but I'm never gonna do it 
because I have no faith left in the process of call-out vigilante justice. And I'm not saying I'm totally against me tooing people because I think in some cases it totally is the brave and admirable thing to do. But in my case, I feel like I just know too much about the dark side of social media shaming to ever want to participate in it again. You know, I feel like the story would end up being taken out of my control, warped and twisted in all kinds of unpredictable ways, it would end up just haunting both me and the person I'd be accusing, which in this case, honestly, neither of us deserves. So I'm just not willing to take that risk, except maybe in some very extreme situation, which this just isn't. It's not worth it. And likewise, when a mob is at my doorstep demanding I condemn Buck Angel to save myself from cancellation, no! I'm just not gonna do that. I'm a conscientious objector. I'm willing to go to Twitter jail for this. Take me away, boys. So not only is Natalie willing to weaponize Me Too against her critics, because that is what she is doing here, but she feels that on one hand, that outing a sexual harasser or no longer idolizing Buck Angel because of all the disgusting, harmful shit he's done in the past is too much, yet directing a torrent of abuse at small, marginalized voices. That's perfectly fine. To be clear, nobody owes anybody to come out about their sexual assault. But Natalie's reasoning for why she's not doing this? None of that is offered to the people she pretended to give a damn about earlier in her video. Natalie can effectively finger of deaf people, and she's chosen to do that to people venting over the fact that she'd hurt them. Natalie isn't a relatively small YouTuber, and her audience has grown gradually more and more toxic as the decent people who once watched her content have abandoned her community because of her actions. She knows full well what was going to happen to the people she highlighted in her video. Yet she chose to do it anyway. What for? Showing us some people venting in a very tame fashion talking about how they told us Natalie was a terrible person, or that they couldn't believe Natalie was in fact a terrible person. That's the two general categories she showed. And for that, said people deserve to be broken. People who don't have the money or the support structure Natalie does. People whose community is strictly online, who have been shunned and forced out. The most vulnerable among us are the ones who have suffered in all of this. And Natalie just doesn't seem to give a damn, even though she instigated this, knowingly. She feels like she has to get the final twist of the knife. And for what? I realize that people on Twitter aren't actually going to watch this video, they're just going to make fun of the title and how long it is. Which, fair enough, but they're the ones whose accusations against me are so numerous and convoluted it required a feature-length film to respond to except you didn't respond to a single core issue. All this video contains is a broken model with a dishonestly presented case study that fails to support it upon further investigation. Derailment of the core issue of Buck Angel's actions in harming the non-binary community and outing a trans woman as part of domestic abuse. You framed your good faith critics as fascists in their methods and perhaps even a literal fascist, you presented benign venting, much of which you had to hunt for as a hate mob, label criticism of you as psychological rape before projecting your actions onto us, all throughout which you demonstrated a lack of desire to even engage with genuine criticism. The only part in your video with any actual merit in my mind was your 10 minute discussion about how things had impacted you, which is why I'm not responding to that here. However, Everything else in your 1 hour 40 minute video was an absolute waste of your audience's time. And yet people pretend like it achieves something of value, like it actually has some profound message. When no, it didn't. It's just a sad reminder of how far the non-binary community has to go before its voices are listened to as equal, before its members are treated with respect, before we can live as is our right as human beings. And that's all I really have to say. I think I'm done. I'm tired of the bullshit and the excuses, of the pity party Natalie throws for herself 
over being criticised for something she knew was an issue for the non-binary community. All because having a star on her show was more important to Natalie than our well-being. We deserve better, but I doubt we'll get it. It seems the only way to make it in this day and age is to play to the status quo. Something Natalie and Buck Angel seem all too eager to do. But I and others refuse to be treated in this way. We stand and we stand tall. We will be heard. So now that we've made it to the end of her video and found Natalie's work to be in want of many things, what could she have done to have avoided this? What can we learn from her example in things to avoid? I think these are fair questions and I do have a few thoughts on how to go about it. The first is to put the core issue up front. Natalie spends the first 21 minutes of her video fucking around with a broken model and a case study that completely invalidates said model. The way Natalie gives the impression otherwise is to cut out important elements of what took place. Just avoid that. If you want to talk models, do so later. But your main goal should be addressing the concerns of the people criticising you in good faith. Which brings us to the actual segment on Buck Angel. Engage with people's criticism. Don't just say the tweets are out of context. Go through and demonstrate the relevant context. Vindicate both Buck and yourself if you believe yourself to be without fault. The same with the Lana Wachowski issue. Don't blow off criticism in this vein on the grounds that it was 14 years ago. As shown earlier, Buck Angel hasn't stopped talking about it. So why should the people who Buck forced further into the closet with his actions be expected to do so? Don't waste time comparing people carrying out very basic research to ensure that they're not falsely condemning a man to fascists. Don't repeatedly undermine the motives of your non-binary critics, presenting them as insincere, that this is a jealousy issue. Certainly not as you show some of them on screen. Once that's done, however, you have free reign. Yet, if upon further investigation you discover that you can't actually justify what Buck Angel has said about non-binary people or that people had a good point on the Karen Winslow and Lana Wachowski issue, apologise. Bluntly, plainly, without caveat, apologise. Explain what you did wrong. Discuss the facts that you knew there was a problem, but ignored it. Talk about how this was reckless for someone with such a large audience. Most importantly though, show us how you intend to make amends for what occurred and prevent this from happening again in future. Don't make it about you as a person. Don't promote yourself. Focus on your actions when you apologise because those actions are what people are criticising. If you endlessly talk about how you're not a bad person, that you're really good deep down, that never addresses what you've done, what people are taking issue with. That's a distraction that centers you as a person over your actions and the harm they caused others. Next, apply the same investigation to your own tweets and the response to criticism you've received. Don't just hand wave parts as, I don't know what I was saying. Connect the lessons you have learned from one example and see if they apply to other issues people have raised. Most of all, reflect. Decide whether you simply fucked up, whether what you said was justified, or if it's a mixture of the two. And if you apologise, be prepared for not everyone to accept your apology, as is their right. At which point, feel free to discuss issues such as people who took things too far as well as the impact everything has had on you. Make this section distinct to your apology or defence. Remind people that how harshly others responded to you has no bearing on the ethics of your own actions. Because yes, I do believe there needs to be self-reflection by people such as myself on how we can impact the lives of others, so that we may better decide how to act in future. This can't be used externally though to tone police the bulk of your critics who were operating with good faith and did not cross the line. But we do listen. I think following this structure you could have achieved so much more. But sadly you didn't. Which is why I think 
It's goodbye from here, Natalie. I don't see myself ever coming back to watch your videos. The damage is just too extensive and the apathy you've shown towards us is stretched on too long. I'm just tired of trying. And I know some people are going to say that this is petty, that I should put aside my issues with Natalie to support the good she does. But here's the thing. What these people are effectively doing is treating the well-being of non-binary people as a luxury, something to be bashed with and sold off if needs be. And I know many people see Natalie as this almost prophetic figure leading members of the far right to the left. The thing is, this recent example makes me question that entirely. What has happened in Breadtube recently is not former right-wingers become more left-leaning, it's the entire left being yanked towards the center, at the exclusion of many marginalized people. Natalie's methods are clearly not working as people pretend they are. We're seeing alt-right language such as SJW leftist and woke scold being adopted on a large scale. I feel as if Breadtube, in its hero worship, is going through what the second community started to go through in 2011. That we've been duped, played fool to a Trojan horse. We're not correcting large numbers of the far right, they're infiltrating what was once the left and driving a wedge between Breadtube curators and marginalized voices. They're increasing levels of toxicity, not reducing it, and all whilst being enabled by people such as Natalie. And there's such an easy way to avoid this. Namely, stop glorifying bigots. Don't promote them. Don't have them voice credit roles. Don't share them uncritically on your Twitter feed. Don't act as if they're a force for good on account of them sharing one or two qualities with the left. Isolate them and help them fix themselves before you start doing that. We need an ideological quarantine period, a period of redemption. Places where these people can go to get support without dragging their toxic baggage into communities that were once viewed as safe spaces for marginalized people to hang out. Because we can't keep going through this. We can't keep abandoning spaces we've helped set up because a bunch of Natalie fans think being a ContraPoints viewer makes them a trans ally. And I don't think we're alone in this. Very recently in the community, I seen the disgusting handling of racism, of ableism, of sexism. And when you start making room for these things in leftist spaces, people of color, disabled people, and women will leave those spaces, just like trans people. And that is on you. So we need better content creators, morally and pragmatically. And we need them fast. Because I fear what is happening in the left currently. Truly I do. But we can fight it. But it's not something one person can do alone. We need to stand together to overcome this issue that could make or break the left. Silence the bigots, not the marginalized voices. Now if you appreciate what myself and Adita do here on the channel, do know that you can support us via Patreon. Your support gives us the funds to keep going and to keep putting out videos involving this level of research. You can also check out our other videos to see more of what we have to offer. So with that said, we'd just like to thank our Patreon sponsors, giving a special thanks to the following people. Hannah Banghart, Matthew Kovac, Mook Gay, Wellington Marcus, Atlas 5, and Sash Daniels. And for myself and Adita, take care now.